Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, those were great presentations to follow, thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank you for your work in this field and um, your interest in the topic. Um, this is my first, I've, I've done work as Sasha touched on, I helped draft some of the ideas for the Michigan um, Foster Care Bill of Rights, which still hasn't passed, but um, and I've also talked to young girls currently in foster care, uh, but this is my first time publicly sharing my personal story, so bear with me. Um, I'm more than happy to share um, my story, I just, I'm going to try as hard as I can to keep it short and sweet. Um, so I entered foster care in 2006 when I was 11 years old. I had overall four placements, um, and before I start, I feel responsible to mention um, throughout my childhood, uh, whenever someone would find out that I had spent time in foster care, um, a pretty common reaction was, no way, you don't look like a foster kid, or you don't seem like you spent time in foster care. And so, um, because I am representing the um, foster care experience, I, I don't think most of you need to hear this anyway, but um, obviously it's a diverse group of kids, um, and my experience um, only touches, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg. So what I did is I reached out to some fellow MSU alums who are also previous foster youth and told them that I was presenting here and asked for some of their um, suggestions. And so some of the things in here are some of their feedback too. Um, so yeah, my presentation is much more informal. It's filled with a lot of embarrassing childhood pictures. <laughs> um, so I first just want to share some background about um, my time pre-foster care and pre-entering the system um, when I lived with my parents. Um, so I had a hyperlink to the house I grew up in um, because I think that helps to show um, we come from diverse backgrounds and all shapes and sizes, but I don't think I know how to work this well enough to use the hyperlink, so just know the thought was there. Um, so my parents have been married for 24 years, um, and my mom, when I was a child, uh, was a teacher's aide who worked specifically with children with autism. Um, and my father owned his own construction company. My mom was working on her degree um, when I was a young child, and my father didn't receive a high school diploma. I have three siblings. Um, I have two older siblings that you can see here. Let's see a pointer, can we go? Uh, that's my older sister. She's currently 32. My older brother, who's currently 29, um, that's me and my grandfather, um, and we originally lived with my grandmother, then moved on to public housing, and then eventually bought our house. Um, and my early childhood, I remember my family being pretty great. I remember taking family vacations, I remember um, participating in school sports, um, and my parents were pretty well known in the neighborhood. Um, I remember things getting bad around the age of eight. Um, my parents are heroin addicts, um, which I think is important to bring up because it's an epidemic right now. Um, and Sasha sort of touched on this when she was talking about um, needing more support for drug rehabilitation. But um, I just want to give the background that um, how their addiction started was my dad, like I said, worked in construction. He has um, a genetic back disorder and was told when he was 35 that his back looked like an eight-year-old man's. Um, and he was missing 12 discs at that point. Um, so this is mid-90s. He was prescribed um, Oxycontin, Vicodin, and um, anyone who's been touched by the heroin epidemic can uh, guess the rest of the story from there. Um, so, I, as I said, I entered the system at the age of 11, and my younger sister, who is now 13 and was just under two at the time, um, was also removed from the home with me. Um, I was taken to a group home, um, 
and spent two nights there and following that I was placed with my grandparents for a year and a half and I was kept with my little sister throughout that time. Um, after that, we were removed from my grandparents' home. They were told that they were too old um, to provide care. So we were placed in separate foster homes um, where I spent a little over a year. And then I moved to Michigan um, with an aunt. And that's how I ended up here. And I graduated from high school and went to Michigan State. Um, some of the challenges I faced during this time are things you've already heard. Um, I was definitely dealing with the grief and loss and trauma that's already been mentioned. Um, my entire family was taken away, I wasn't able to see them. Um, I was in the same school system, which I was fortunate for, but then I had to deal with explaining to my friends and peers um, why I was moving and where my parents were. And um, Additionally, um, oftentimes there wasn't food in the home, um, we didn't have hot water or electricity, so um, I wasn't able to take a shower and I didn't want to go to school for that reason, um, so I missed a lot of school. <coughs> Um, and I think these are things that we need to think about um, when we talk about kids transitioning um, into higher education. I didn't learn how to add fractions, I didn't learn my multiplication tables, um, and I was never held back a grade, so I was moving on with these kids who had learned the same things. Um, during this time, some resources that helped me were um, mentors, um, being able to stay in touch with certain family members. Um, additionally, I kind of um, breezed over this in the first slide, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about neighborhood support systems. Um, something that was really important for me as a young child um, were the families of my friends. I think many of them had an idea of something was going on um, and oftentimes they would pick me up from school and feed me dinner and I think um, people underestimate how big of a role that can play. Um, and also I would like to mention the importance of after school programs. I was fortunate enough to be in a well-funded school that had youth enrichment programs so I could stay at school um, for a couple of extra hours and receive additional education. Um, but a lot of kids don't have that opportunity so that's something we need to think about, um, providing funding for that. Um, okay. Um, so I worked really hard to catch up in school. Um, it was sort of a coping mechanism as well. I knew education was my way out. Uh, with that being said, I didn't think um, a higher education would, would be possible for me. I just didn't think I would be able to afford it. I didn't even understand where to begin with that application process. Um, I was first generation. Um, and I attribute my success to this day to um, one moment where one social worker mentioned, um, I, I was expressing how I was just really nervous about the future, uh, I didn't know what it held, I was feeling really hopeless, um, and she said, oh, no, 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 no. They'll, they'll pay for your college, they'll pay for your college, and just breezed on. At the time, I was probably 12 or 13. She was thinking I wasn't thinking about these things yet, um, but I, of course, was like, wait, 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 what was that? What programs? Um, and I think just hearing that gave me hope and inspiration to stay in school, focus in school. Um, it gave me the self-esteem I needed um, to realize that I was capable of receiving a higher education. Um, so I think that touches on the issue that uh, a lot of children entering the system don't know their rights. They don't know what programs are available to them. Um, and this social worker sort of brought this up um, casually. And I think that the Bill of Rights, which we don't have in Michigan yet, is something that could really help with that because as soon as you enter a foster home, you're hearing, this is what you're entitled to, this is what your future could look like, um, if this is happening in this foster home, you can come to this person um, for help, just things like that. So I think that the Bill of Rights should definitely be something we focus on. Um, 
I would also like to talk about um, uh, programs that help fund college. Um, ET the ETV program, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, um, but if it wasn't for the ETV program, I don't know if I would have made it through college. Um, they provide a living stipend and they're really great about not limiting you. It can be for books or housing, transportation, you could use it for gas money, I mean. And that stipend really took so much stress off of me and allowed me to focus on my schoolwork and not need to work 40 hours a week. Um, which leads me to <laughs> talk about um, Sasha already mentioned this, but what's going on with Medicaid right now. Um, expecting foster youth to work uh, 20 hour, 29 hours a week while going to school in order to receive access to health care, which we definitely need because um, I can speak to the um, mental health issues that you experience from um, going through the system and um, yeah so I just think that certain resources like health care and stipends that help um, foster youth pay for food and transportation are uh, really important so we should continue funding those programs and create more. Um, Yeah, these are some recommendations I threw together. I'm obviously not a policy expert or an expert in the field, so um, I guess I really think healthcare is important. I'm gonna go back. This quote up here is from one of the other foster youth that I spoke to. This is something she sent me. Um, I don't think people realize the stress you're under when you don't have parents to talk to, you don't have anybody guiding you, you're sort of blindly figuring out how to make it through school. Um, and a lot of us are working uh, close to full time already to be able to afford to live. Um, and so then to throw on this work requirement just to receive basic health care is um, um, really throws a wrench in things, yeah. That. Um, I would agree. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think, oh, something I want to talk about that I didn't enough is um, mentors. Um, so, I attribute my success also to a handful of people um, who were with me throughout my life that provided um, just advice and support and were role models for me. I think that's something a lot of children who are in foster care don't have. Um, and it's so important just to have somebody, just to know that you have somebody who cares about you and to have a positive relationship with an adult figure. But also just someone to say, um, you know, this is what the common application is. This is how you fill out your FAFSA form. Um, these are things that I think get lost with transition out of care. Um, yeah, um, I, I know I breezed through that, but I sort of wanted to do this more informally and I hope you all ask questions and that can open up more conversation. Please feel free to ask anything you're curious about. I am more than happy to share my experience. Um, with you all. So thank you. <laughs>